Basically, I just start off with a riff or something, like an idea, just a feel. And then uh, for Kill or Be Killed, that's that's what I did. I just started out with, I think, um, you know, you can, what I, the original song is called Springsteen, I like, because I was learning the Bruce Springsteen song. So there's a feel from one of the, from one of his songs. And I think I just had like that drum beat, that driving drum beat, and just started building, um, building it. Um, didn't even think about lyrics or anything for a while. And, um, and then it ended up lyrically being about just being a savage, like kill or be killed, like go out there and get it at, uh, you know, at whatever price it is, just uh, be a savage in life, um, you know, go out there and kill or be killed. For the bass, um, the bass I used, it's a Scarby Rick and, Rickenbacker plugin by Contact, and it's, I wanted a real aggressive driving bass. It's got a lot of attack, drive, and string noise. Uh, very trebly so like if you, as you hear in the very beginning of the song it's just very it's just very aggressive it's got an aggressive tone on it and it just worked with the driving of the of the drums um, it's a lot of grit a little grit and power with it I chose the keyboard sound just because uh, I don't really have that much bass gear, you know, to be honest. If I had if I had DI bass pedals and stuff that maybe that, you know, like a Sans amp or something like that, I probably would I might have used that, but I don't have anything to really get that tone too much. So on something that's so driving with the with the rock song like this, this this sound really gets it done for me, <laughs> you know. If it if it's kind of hard sometimes to do faster notes or more subtle stuff, but it just so happened to work for this song. A lot of, a lot of my songs I don't use bass like a uh, plug-in bass the intro I wanted something a little different to differentiate between the between uh between the verse and you know the intro where I'm singing and I'm not singing and so yeah the intro It's gotta have that. You gotta hit that little, that little uh, major second right there. So that's what's gonna. That's kind of the driving intro part, and then into the verses, we just got the basic. It's just, it's just hitting that quarter note right there, and it's kind of leaving a lot of space for the vocal to breathe, and it's still driving it along. Um, so we're just, I'm just kind of keeping that real empty. And 
and then when it hits that no i just i just rest on it and then i, I build it up in the daw just a big swell i think a lot of times i'll even like record a bass or or guitars and then i'll 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 reverse it and then for like a measure more just to bring it in make the chorus hit real hard I think I tried that, 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 that like with the guitars. That's what the guitars are doing. I think initially I did something like that. I don't. I think I think I just chose the quarter notes because, like I said, it kind of just stuck, gave them a little more air to it, you know. And the guitars kind of filled out that frequency, anyways, you know. It just had they they kind of just held that held its own. When I'm building a song, like I never know. It's hard. It's hard to know until you start stacking stuff, you know. And then you see kind of what works with it and be, sometimes you'd be surprised what does and what doesn't which if you heard it on its own you'd be like man that, that was all that was there it's like everything else comes together man it's just like building a building a cake dude the you putting baking soda eating baking soda by itself sucks you put it in with the cake somehow those flavors work and the chorus real basic you know i mean i don't know it's super simple just when the water And it just has that little syncopation, that weird little little hit where it comes in. But that part's just real basic. Um, I'm not doing too much stuff. I'm just want it to be. I just want it to fill out the sound. I just want it to be real big right there. Not a lot. Not a ton of movement. I think the vocals are doing most of the movement. I just want it to be real, just full. Um, and um, that kind of goes in, and it leads into the outro. Which has a little more movement. Um. So this part, I was kind of, I was just like, I, again, it's gonna be a little more driving, kind of like the intro part. So I just went loud, I'll just. And let me see. So I'm just driving along, kind of playing it pretty sloppy, and um, but I just wanted something to drive it out right there and kind of build up. It kind of works up. This one, you know, you're kind of just in the D D minor position going up, and you got the F, and you're just kind of going up the scale. You're just kind of building up the scale on the on that on the outro. So that's kind of the basis of the of the of the bass for that man. The, the Rickenbacker bass really just came through with that. That's the same bass you hear in um, Charlie Puth's Attention. You just want attention. I don't know if you've heard that song. You can play it right now and then get your video <laughs> demonetized. <laughs> So for this song, I used my uh, jazz bass that I got in Las Vegas, actually, when we moved headquarters out to Vegas. We went to Sam Ash, and I picked up a cool, like, cream white jazz bass. So I recently installed Seymour Duncan SJB2s, which is the hot one. It's got kind of like a low-mid bassy boost, and then the highs almost kind of are rolled off, like the tones rolled off a little bit. So that tone is actually really nice with the jazz bass, because I notice it's a little too bitey on occasion. So uh, I have those pickups, and then I recently got an Omega bass bridge, which is pretty much the badass knockoff version. It's kind of knockoff. I mean, it's the same thing they just printed different words into the bottom anyway on to the next so the the bridge i always love high mass stuff i have high, ma high mass stuff on almost all of my bases so uh i got those and the pickups going and then initially when i recorded it the first time at home i plugged straight into the board and just kind of compressed and stuff like that and then when we got here i ended up using the uh, ged 2112 pedal or the di 2112 i'm not sure the name of it exactly but it's the newest version they have with the most bells and whistles when it comes to like a stomp box and we got a killer tone out of that i was expecting more, because it's made by Tech 21, so I was expecting a Tech 21-ish gain structure, which it did have, but it was actually really flexible. So that turned out to give me like a perfect amp sim for the type of tone I was going for, which was just a touch of drive, and then I compressed it in post just a little bit on in the, in the box, pretty much. But it was a pretty good tone. I mean, the perfect amount of bite where it kind of, you hear the bite on the attack, and then not as much when it rings out, you know, it's kind of like the, just the perfect little bit of growl. So that's the tone I was going for. I stayed pretty simple on on pedals and stuff, I just went straight into the GED pedal and out.
So in the first one, I was pretty much the only person that did something with like not very much drive or not very much presence. You know, it was just real like almost subby, but it was really just kind of laid back the whole time. So uh, for this one, I decided to give a little more drive because once something's in the mix, it's really easy to lose it if you don't have the proper like headphones or subwoofer or whatever, you know. So I put a little bit of drive on it for this one, and I learned that pretty much from listening to everybody else. And the way that their things just kind of sang in the mix was a lot better. Mine was good too, but like I said, if you don't have the right sound system, like if you're watching that one on your phone, mine was kind of underwhelming. So I tried to make it a little more present without stepping on toes or anything, you know? So that's probably what I learned the most from the first couple episodes. So when I first started the song, I listened to that crazy intro, which was like, it's the big, almost like circusy stuff. It reminds me of like a Psycho Circus Kiss thing. <laughs> that's the vibe I got from that. But um, I was just doing like octave, just following the roots, you know, for a while. And then when I got here to record it, I just omitted it entirely because it wasn't really that like special. It kind of let the intro do its thing there. So then I just came in, chugging with the guitar, kind of like Barracuda type of thing. I tried to do a little bit of like movement just to make it you know, a little bit more personal because anybody could do a triplet, dig, 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 you know? So I did the little jump back and forth from D to A, you know, which Chris said kind of sounds like the Bee Gees, which gives it more of the disco vibe, I guess, if you were saying. So like, dun, 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 dun. and that, that little bit kind of makes it more gallopy too, a little bit more epic in my mind. Even though all it is is one note, that interval is just really nice. So I did that and then in between like section movements, I would do the little walk down up high just to give it a little more, a little more spice. And then for, the verses, kind of on both of them, I did them the same. So like, they're almost identical performance from first to second, which is fine, it served the song, it's kind of what it had to do. And then for the choruses, there was, when you hear it, it almost has what it needs already. Like without the bass, he sent the master with no bass and I listened through and I was like, God, it's almost like fine how it is with the things. But there were underlying little guitar riffs or just layerings of things he had in there and I was picking little melodies out of them. So what I did was just follow the roots, obviously, as you would, but then in between the root notes, I would kind of outline the chord and follow these little, these same little licks that he was playing underneath. And it perfectly like flowed with the vocal melody and everything it ended up working out really well. I was afraid it was gonna step on toes a little too much just because how melodic that whole section is. But what I ended up doing, yeah, I was actually pretty happy with how it turned out. So that's pretty good. From verse to chorus, that was fun. So there's a little da 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 da, like a snare thing that happens. And when I heard it, the track had no bass the first time I heard it. So I heard the snare thing and I was like, oh, that's asking for a syncopation, a la Getty Lee and Neil Peart. So I had to do that. So in between verses, it does the da 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 da. And so I kind of followed the vocal melody and there's a little guitar riff under it. And I just followed that in every time. And anytime I heard that snare pattern, I was sure to follow it with that same riff. So coming out of the first chorus, it actually does this cool little movement and does that syncopation again. So doing that in and out of the chorus was really cool and it's a cool little segue back and forth. And syncopating with the drummer is just like my favorite thing to do, so gotta do it every time I can. And then for the outro, Listening to it alone, there was just big driving stuff going on. And I felt like if there was any time for me to do any sort of cool bass stuff, it's now because it's pretty wide open and the vibe changes. It gets really epic toward the end. So I went with like a cool, another sort of chord outline thing, just a cool melodic thing that kind of stayed with the eighth notes. And um, it also works really well with the melodies considering the guitars are just kind of chugging and hitting like the lows and the tops back and forth. The bass kind of gives it all a little bit more movement, a little more like a pathway, if you will, through the chords. So that was cool, that was a lot of fun, and it was cool to see the original song and how different the original track was from what I did, and just, it's, that's the funnest part about this series is seeing how every bass player thinks completely differently and like how the composer composes differently and all this stuff, and like, 
I, I just love doing these episodes for that very reason, so that's that for me. Listening to this, again, it is kind of 80s new wave-ish, so I'm not thinking like a full-bodied, big, fat, deep, scooped out bass tone like what I normally gravitate towards. So I won't use a jazz bass, I won't use an active bass. Uh, I'm gonna use something with character. Okay? And the reason why I'm choosing character is like, listen to it. This song has character. That chord has character. And it's like, is this Muse Knights of Sidonia, you know? And then this vocal melody. You know, it, this song has has a vibe to it. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm just really thinking that character is going to win out in 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 this case. So that means not the J bass, not the P bass, not the normal or the active five string or anything like that. This to me, in my head, of the tools I have is gonna either be my Gibson Grabber, uh, my Guild Starfire, or maybe a precision bass with flat wound strings. That's gonna be my last option because I really think the other two are gonna give me what I'm going for. So I'm thinking character pieces. 
And this is a reason why when people ask, why should you own more than one or two bases? It's this, right? Those character bases are the ones that are really going to make or break it. You might not realize it, but play the same thing on a precision or a jazz or one of the vanilla instruments and the vibe is going to get sucked out. I like the idea of uh, avoiding the downbeat since the kick drum is giving that pulse. Boom, 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 boom. So maybe ignoring the first one. Boom, bop, bop, bump, bump. Up, up, and I, I don't know. Maybe that'll give it more of a playfulness rather than a mm, 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 kind of what you would expect. And that's what I always cater towards. Not that there's a problem with vanilla bass playing, but I always, I kind of think of it like this: If you wanted a vanilla bass player, you would have hired one. The fact that you asked me, I'm kind of different. I, I don't do the, the the normal safe things that. You would expect to hear on a pop track or whatever. Um, so you're coming to me. You must want that. So I'll give you the vanilla part. It'll be in one of the takes, but then there's going to be another one that's much more experimental, and that's kind of my flavor. Um, that's what I'm known for. It's what people ask for. So what do I want to do right here? So the obvious thing... That's the easiest thing I can do. So the next most obvious choice in my mind is to do upbeats. So instead of locking with that kick, let's do the opposite. Let's just play off of it. I'm kind of digging this range of the neck also instead of like living in the, the money notes. I think this part is gonna live nicer up here um, in this range. So now I'm just going to kind of loop this section for a little while and, and just, I don't know, play around. There's no wrong answers, starting on the roots, starting on the thirds, starting on the fifths, and, and really create like a, a groove that's not bum, 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 bum. Not that there's something wrong with that, and that might end up being what I do. But first, I want to explore the space. All right. So basically, it starts on the downbeat. If you're counting two, three, four, one, and two, and three, and four, and four, uh, 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 uh. So it's like, it's it's a bit of both. It's more on the bouncy side because I'm playing more upbeats, but I'm giving you a downbeat at the beginning of the phrase. The turnaround fill includes downbeats. And then when it goes to the A minor, I'm using that to get me um, back to the D. So it's kind of the, the, the best of both worlds. Oh, I'm really trying to pay attention to the note length. So in other words, there's a huge difference between this and this and this. So the way that I'm playing that groove, I'm, I'm trying to find which is the one that not just sounds best, but sounds best with everything else. Because if I'm playing shorter than the vocalist is singing, it's going to do something different than if I'm playing longer or the same. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm just trying to find out which one do I like most, which one has the coolest effect of like, ooh, that's an awesome bass line. The bass line is the same. But the way that I'm saying it, the the the, the nuance is everything. So now that you call me kill. Alright, so I've got a couple options here. I can just play whole notes. D4. And also when it comes to playing that that rhythmic figure, again, being the bass player, I've got a few options. So every time that kill it be kill, da, 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 every time that comes up, I can do this. So that was just staying on the root. Ba -da -ba -bum. Or I can play the, the melody. Da -ka -ka -da -da -da. I can actually play the, the melody. So I gotta land on that B flat afterwards. Uh, down an octave, that would look like this. Uh, kinda like. I kinda like the higher one. Or I could harmonize with it. The, the idea is I'm gonna line up with that rhythm, but what am I gonna do on it? Am I gonna hold the one? Am I gonna play a melody? Or. 
or you know what I mean I can I can harmonize it with it in a multitude of different ways and I'm not really sure which which one I'm digging yet so I'm just gonna play that chorus over and over till I land on something um I'm liking a little bit of motion instead of one two three four one I also don't want to add too much one two three and four and one because the vocal is happening there. And this is bass playing 101. If you wanna come up with cool ideas, do them when no singing is happening. That's when the bass line stands out the most. So if I do this. Like, I mean, yeah, that's a cool part, but it's walking all over the vocal and instead of noticing how nice they play with each other, you're just noticing one over the other. And um, that's not harmony. I mean, technically it is. But to me, harmony is uh, everyone smiles. Everyone's happy. So I think allowing some space for that vocal. Yeah, so something as simple as one. Da -da, bum, wa -da. So I'm just going from the root to the fifth of that chord, sliding it up to the sixth of that chord, which happens to be the fifth of the next chord. So that's one of the reasons why music theory is so cool to know, because you can do tricks like that when you're like, oh, I'm not really sure which notes to go to. Now I just gave you several. So I think that's a cool way. Do you hear how he's playing with the rhythm? It kind of establishes a new 4-4. Four, four. Right? That temporary downbeat was on the upbeat. But it kind of sounds like... It's a metric modulation very momentarily. Only half of a bar probably. But what can I do to pull that out? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm probably going to ignore it. Okay, and right there, did you notice I, I, I did some ridiculous fill? It's not a good one. I'll tighten it up and make it better. But why did I do it there? Listen. <laughs> Nothing is happening until that ba da ba ba and the guitar is just wow around the vocalist went away the drums aren't doing anything cool until the da 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 so if there was a time to throw in something cool in bass land it's going to be right there why nothing is happening if i could just play the right notes So I think I got the chorus and the verse down. I just want to get the transition to this outro. So the, the, the cue for that is, I, I'm not sure how many times it is. I have it written down as five. It might be six. I don't know. I probably miscounted. And I missed it that last time. So the difference, or the thing that's going to cue me for the outro, listen. There's a, a reverse symbol, a shh, that kind of happens. Yeah, so there's a... The guitars kind of do a reverse thing. It gets louder, big, big crescendo. Da, 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 da. And then we're at the uh, bridge. Or the outro, I guess. I don't want to just do the straight da, 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 da. Again, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's what anyone would do. What would I do? I still haven't decided. <laughs> I still haven't decided, but I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. It's going to be some, some sort of movement. So the first thing we did is uh, I chose this bass. This is a Guild Starfire 1966, I think. 
60 something. And uh, signal chain is pretty simple. We're going into some overdrive here, the source audio aftershock, hitting a little bit of overdrive, but it's mostly clean. Um, this, uh, this pedal has a, a clean knob on it. So I'd say we're only hearing about 5% of the distorted signal. I just wanted a little bit of overdrive in there. Um, EQ, I'm just ducking out some of the low end given the, the semi-hollow bass. This just has so much boom to it that you can see I'm cutting out a lot of that bass. And uh, boosting a little bit of 473 also. That kind of a boxy frequency that I'm normally not into. And then uh, over here, the first thing we did is we went into an amp sim. This is the uh, Ampeg B15N from Universal Audio. Ah. And I know it sounds quiet, but that's kind of the point. You want to hit your compressors um, kind of RMSing around minus 18. If you take a look at the meters over here, you can see I'm kind of averaging around this 15, 18, and the peaks are up by 12. That's the signal you want to send to your compressors. So here's what it sounds like when I hit the 1176. A little bit louder, but then we're really going to squash it here with the, uh, the LA two-way. And I just want each note to kind of have a kind of that sucking sound that a lot of compression gives you. And I just knew that these two compressors, the, uh, the 1176 going into the LA-2A, that was going to give me exactly the sound that I wanted. Um, and that's pretty much everything that I tracked just now. Uh, bass, flat wound strings into two pedals, overdrive, and then just, uh, again, some minimal EQ. And then over here, oh, uh, whoops. Yeah, and then over here, just three plugins, a B15, an 1176, and an LA two way. And if you want to hear the dit, like where it started and where it ended up, here's uh, here's what it sounds like after all the processing. And if I turn off all of the plugins here, uh, disable all. And if I come over here and I mute, or just turn off the EQ and turn off the overdrive, uh, this is the sound that we started with. Ah. So again, a lot of character in this bass already, but a little bit of processing goes a long way. I'm loving it. So that's it. The signal chain that we recorded, all I did in post is I just added uh, some tape to it and some very, very minor EQ.
on film? Yeah, we're on. Oh, well then, yeah. Now I'm going to, as long as we're on film. There we go. I used my uh, Squire fretless jazz bass that my mom gave to me one random Christmas. Uh, it's just a like cool sounding fretless. It's, um, it's kind of like, the way it looks is meant to be like a copy of like Jaco Pistorius, like there's no pick guard or anything. It doesn't sound anything like that. <laughs> but um, I just, I, I knew I wanted a fretless tone for this. Uh, so I used, yeah, my Squire uh, fretless jazz bass. I turned off the neck pickup, it was all bridge, so no neck, all bridge, tone closed. So it was a little warmer, a little more mid-range honky. Um, they're not the most like transparent of pickups, but I really like that sound when it comes to other jazz basses. Um, and so I knew I was just gonna default to that one, and then when I played it with the fretless, it gave it that kind of like mid-range Mwah, kind of sound, <laughs> and I knew that's what I wanted, so that's what I went with. So when I heard it, I, I know there's like a lot of, there's like some modulation, and I thought, okay, maybe like a phaser would be really cool, or like a flanger would be really cool. I always use like envelope filters all over a lot of my stuff, um, but after a pretty serious amount of back and forth, I realized that at the end of the day, I just wanted some compression and a little bit of gain. Um, so I knew I wanted some gain structure, just a little bit of bite, but overall, it's very clean, like there's no, uh, flanger or anything like that. I brought some of my stuff, uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's just some compression and, and a little bit of gain. That's it. Uh, for the gain, we use the uh, the Dark Glass B7K. Yeah, that's what we use. I just wanted a little bit of uh, a little bit of gain structure, so we used the Dark Glass B7K Ultra, and uh, it was great sounding. I liked it. I like. I remember when Nikki used um, a lot of effects, especially in the first one. I, th I think she was the only one to use like a modulation effect, and I heard that, and I was like, "That's really cool." Her part like super jumps out. So when it came time to write my part, I kind of wanted to like get my toes in the water because I heard the modulation of the keyboard. I thought maybe I can kind of go with that. At the end of the day, I decided against it. Um, but I will say that was like one thought that did sit in my head a little bit was like, okay, I don't have to just be like super clean when I write this part. I can go uh, with some modulation or I can be a little bit more expressive when it comes time to it and it's still gonna come out really well. So that was one thing I think that, that did jump out a little bit to me. At the end of the day, I really just wanted to do what fit the song. Uh, and that was what was my main focus. I thought, what is gonna complement this song, you know? Um, and then when I first heard the song, my immediate thought was this is super reminiscent to like Pink Floyd. This feels a lot like, like psychedelic disco <laughs> almost. So I kept thinking like Roger Waters, you know, Pink Floyd kind of sound, very funky, but also very psychedelic, which is why I knew that when it came time to putting equipment together, even before the writing process, when I was looking for textures and sounds, um, I knew I wanted to go fretless, just because I'm a huge fan of Pink Floyd, I'm a huge fan of Roger Waters. Um, even like in my, uh, in the intro, I don't play on the one, I kind of let the one hang, and then I slide into the note after that, I come in late. Uh, and that all comes um, from Roger Waters. So I knew that I wanted to have a fretless. Uh, I knew that I kind of wanted, at least for the beginning, to play uh, very spacey. Uh, and then when the main part of the song comes in, because the intro is far and away the most different part of the song. They, they don't ever revisit it. You know, uh, you'll see some songs that they'll have the intro, and then that's the same as the outro. And the song they don't really ever revisit the intro at all. Um, so I knew it was gonna be two distinctly different approaches. For the beginning, I wanted to go very spacey, I wanted to play out, I wanted to like do like plenty of slides so you really know it's a fretless and really give it some, some breath. Um, and then when the main part came in, I wanted to play really tight. So that's when you get the, you know, doon, ticka, doon, ticka, doon, ticka, doon, you know? I wanted to play super tight to that. Uh, and then when it gets to the chorus, I thought, okay, well this is very, there's a lot more air to this one. I said, okay, well I can either fill it, I can do some cool fills on top, I can kind of uh, jump out a little bit, or I can let that air be. I can let it be open 
And I thought, okay, well, if I'm gonna do that, how do I be complimentary and not have it just feel empty? And I thought, okay, well, then what do I do? Playing dyads always sounds good, you know, just, just the dyad. And then on a fretless, I decided to play the dyad and then drag it, just pull it so it, and it's this big, heavy sound, especially when you compose it with the gain structure. Um, it sounded really, really cool, and it ended up being, um, it ended up being more than I was expecting. I want, like, I had this idea in my head, but then when I started stacking gain and, and figuring out what I wanted to, as far as again revisiting textures, um, it ended up working really well. That was, that was my main focus, is that I knew I wanted fretless, I kind of had this idea of like Pink Floyd, um, and then the main part I wanted it to be a little bit more disco-y, so I like popping octaves here and there. Um, yeah, and, and I knew when it came time for the chorus and stuff, I wanted it to be a little bit more airy and a little bit more open, but I didn't want it to feel empty. That was always a trick. So on a composition standpoint, you know, I always just play the five, and that, that tends to fill out really well, and it always seems to fit. It's Uh, it was just, I wanted to just pump it. I wanted to just, you know, boo -doo 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 -doo, just really, really pump it. So straight eight, as you see in the part where it goes from, you know, from D to F, whatever. Um, and then when it gets to the chorus, I'm like, okay, well, we're gonna revisit that. And I wanted to just keep that straight eight pattern, but I also wanted to get a little bit more of that disco thing going on that I had with the octaves. And I thought, okay, well, this is a really good opportunity to let loose a little bit. So I was, you know, doing some octave runs and what have you, just keeping that kind of like 70s disco vibe. Um, and just, but just trying to keep it as driving as possible. Um, yeah, trying to stay as tight to the pocket, as tight to a straight eight, but still giving that disco to, to keep things moving, you know, to keep it a little funky, a little dancey, keep things moving forward.
So this part actually took me a little bit longer than I care to admit uh, to put together both compositionally and tonally. Tonally, uh, I went through a bunch of different options. I was originally going to try something a little bit more modern and heavy just to, you know, because the tone that I ultimately went with, at least at the top, um, is, is kind of, in my opinion, what it needs. But I wanted to try to have some fun and, and see, like, you know, could I do something a little off-center that, that might work? So I was going to do, a, like, a modern Warwick distortion, you know, a typical kind of tone I would go for for something else. Um, I ultimately didn't like that, so I said, okay, well, let me let me try to achieve the sound that I feel this should, you know, the sound in my head that this song should have. Um, I went through a couple different options. The Warwick wasn't going to cut it, so... I thought, okay, well, I need that kind of vintage Ampeg sound with a sort of a darker, mid-heavy, sort of honky kind of tone. Um, so I went through a lot of options, and then the, the sound that I had in my head was under my nose the whole time. So I ultimately ended up using the SG bass with the flat wound, the Daddario Chromes, um, and they're an older set that I had on there uh, like maybe two years ago. Uh, but they've been sitting in a box... I didn't put them in a bag or anything. I just just rolled them up and threw them in a toolbox thinking that one day I'll, I'll put them back on. So I put those back on. And I think because of the conditions and for how long they sat and, you know, all that sort of thing, um, they lost a little bit of that new top end that those strings have. So anyway, I put those on and the pickup combination that I went for was both pickups all the way on wide open at 10 and the tone all the way closed because... Again, I've never played like a 1960-something EBO or EB3, but this newer one, this is a 2015, the front, the neck pickup is ceramic, and I think what they were trying to do is give the muddy pickup a little bit more top end uh, by using the ceramic magnet. But it has a top end that, in my opinion, it, I mean, again, like everything, it depends on how you dial the amp in, but in my opinion, it's it's a little bit of a abrasive top end so that's why i closed the tone um and it gave me all of that low and low mid punch that i wanted and then as far as the di i went di uh my go-to is when i think you know i need a vintage ampeggy kind of tone my my thought is tech 21 vt bass and i i tried it and i couldn't quite get it to do exactly what i wanted it to do and now you know maybe that's just because i'm not as familiar with it I don't use it as often, so what I ultimately ended up doing was going with the Vintage Ultra. Uh, I know the dark glass product really well. I use it often, um, and I just I know how to dial it in now. I can pretty much achieve just about any tone you want between the, the four of these. Uh, the Vintage, the B7K, the X, the Alpha. I'm just, I use them so much that I just I get how they work. So these, uh, this is the tone and the settings that I ultimately used. Uh, a little bump in the bass, uh, considerable bump at 500 hertz, a uh, smaller bump at 750, and then a slight dip on the treble. Uh, we're at a moderate amount of drive, and then the blend is, you know, you're getting more of the drive than the clean, but enough clean shines through to where you still, you know, get the fundamental of the bass. But I just wanted a little bit of grit, and for this pedal, for that bass, this combination, that setting on the drive was was the perfect amount of grit that I wanted. And there's one thing I should mention. Uh, my workflow is I generally hit the audio first. I'll do all my audio parts and then I'll do the video. Um, the reason for that is because I, I want to really take the time to sit there and figure out how to get the most out of my sound. Um, for example, with this, you know, do I want to do pick? Do I want to do fingers? Once I landed on fingers, where do I want to attack it on the string? Um, and I, I typically like to go on that bass a little bit closer to the bridge, but it sounded better to play directly over the neck pickup. So I just, I like to figure all those things out first without the pressure of being on camera. I want to get the audio first and then I mime it. So in the midst of all that, uh, I went for a Red Hot Chili Peppers at the Super Bowl vibe uh, inadvertently and forgot to plug the bass in. However, uh, I'm not trying to fool you anyway. The, the point of the video of me playing is just so you can see what I did. Um, so, I mean, I think it goes without saying that the video of me playing is not the take. It's just me playing along to the take. So, 
So with that out of the way, uh, I think I just dodged a bunch of comments <laughs> about the bass not being plugged in, but still, uh, it's just it's it's predominantly for reference. Um, so onto the composition. Uh, this is where it's tough because I have to wear two hats in these series. Uh, again, another reason why I was hesitant to be in it in the first place is because I, I choose the songs that these videos do. Uh, this is episode three, and up to this point, I've chosen every single song. So therefore, I had to hear the original bass part to figure out, you know, what song is, is going to be good enough that you're going to hear six times in one video. And also, um, you know, what song has a has a bass part that, that can afford to be changed or, you know, enough room for people to do different things to make it interesting. So this song has this particular bass riff. The original version has this particular bass riff at the top that no one else heard before, you know, once I sent them the track with no bass, nobody knew how the bass went. So that's the whole point. It's up to you right apart. I'm the only one who knew how the actual bass went. And once I heard that intro bass lick, for me, I just couldn't unhear it. So I had to include that at the top. So another challenge that comes from kind of wearing both hats in this series of, you know, player and, and video producer um, is do, you know, do I want to write and record a part that I would want to be on record uh, or do I want to write and record a part that would be interesting in a video? And I, I ultimately didn't, de you know, decide one or the other. So I kind of tried to hit elements of both. So the first verse is me you know, doing something that I would want to be on record. Let me just, let me do the best I can to serve the song, not do anything super flashy or, or really interesting where, you know, the bass sticks out and becomes the forefront. So like I said, I hit that riff at the top because I can't unhear it. Um, and then during the verse, when the vocals come in, I just stayed straight quarters. Was it quarters? Yeah, quarters. Um, on the low D, I, I tuned the bass to drop D, just did straight quarters on the low D, um, I did do an interesting, sort of an interesting thing when it when it goes to the A, um, rather than play on the downbeat, I kind of established a new upbeat thing. Um, right. So that was probably the flashiest thing that I did uh, during the verse. Everything else is is real straight down the middle. What's the, what's the best uh, thing I can do to serve the song? So once I had established kind of the idea of, of best serving the song and, and keeping it real simple, um, I thought, well, now let me switch hats, put on my video producer hat. What can I do now that uh, will make the video more interesting to watch? Because while I'm proud of that first verse, I would have done something very similar to the second verse. Um, and that just, I don't know, I just feel like I would have been bored as a viewer. So when it came to the chorus, as far as playing you know, that was where I kind of got stuck of, you know, again, do I want to serve the song? Do I want to be interesting for the video? And the thing is, I mean, I, I can play, you know, like I'm, I'm decent enough, but I'm, I'm not a pro by any means. So to try to figure out an interesting run in a scale, I don't even know my scales, uh, you know, besides pentatonic. Um, it was just a little bit more tough for me to figure out. So I thought, okay, well, let me do something really simple. I just played diamonds of the... Uh, what is it, the A sharp or B flat? The B flat, the C, and the D, just just whole notes, just let them ring. But doing that simple of an approach with the tone that I had already established was really not interesting. So I thought, okay, well, what would Nikki do here? Nikki would find some kind of effect. In her case, it'd probably be a chorus or a flanger. And she would let the effect do the work. So I thought, okay, well, what can I do? So I went through phaser, chorus flanger i didn't like any of them um so i ultimately landed on the bass synthesizer these are not the settings uh because i used a few different settings we'll get to that in a minute i used a few different settings throughout the song and i don't remember exactly what they were um, but for the chorus i needed a big synth swell that would take up that that whole note so when i hit the b flat i want it to wow right and then 
when I go to the C, shuts back down and then the envelope opens real slow. So I had to kind of get the timing right on that to where I could get away with just playing whole notes and it still sounded interesting. Oh, funny enough, the other inspiration that I took from Nikki is listening to the lyrics, um, which is something that I didn't really do, at least during the recording process. But I thought, okay, how can I play off of the lyrics here? So on the third measure of the chorus, the lyric is, um, it's either something's coming and it's giving me the chills or something's calling. I don't know. Something's coming and it's giving me the chills. So I thought, okay, I want to do something that would indicate that something uh, dark is coming. So rather than hit the normal D that I was hitting through the other two measures, you know, the octave uh, fifth fret on the A, I went just to the low D just for that line to indicate that something's coming and it's giving you the chills. So for verse two, like I said, uh, I didn't want to repeat verse one for two reasons. One, it makes a more interesting video to do something a little off center. Um, but two, again, you know, another thing that I learned being a, a non-pro, um, but competent enough uh, from Jamie is, you know, always doing something to push the song forward. And I use that idea in episode one, uh, where I didn't play on the, on the second verse, um, uh, that didn't seem like a good option here and I didn't want to repeat myself. So I said, okay, I need to push the song forward and I need to make something interesting for the video. Um, so I, again, I dialed in another setting on the synth different from the chorus. I forget what it was, but it's a real, like, whoa, 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 you know, like a, like a real Nick kind of tone. Uh, speaking of which, um, you know, just that real, uh, I don't know what word to use to describe it, but it the, the envelope doesn't really ever get a chance to open. And so I just ran a D minor scale. I know I said I didn't know my scales a minute ago. I do know that one. So I just ran the D minor scale um, under the verse, but I didn't want it to interfere with the vocals, which, you know, hence the woof, 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 woof. And I think I did some EQ on it to really roll off the top end. Um, the thing that I found after I had recorded it this is definitely a song that relies on feel. It's it's groove, it's laid back, you know. And I don't typically play laid back. I like faster, heavier music. Um, so because of that, I've developed a tendency to kind of rush the beat. Even if it's ever so slightly, um, it doesn't work in this song. And there is one of the, one of the lines in verse 2... He even drags, the vocals drag a little bit behind the beat, which was even causing further conflict. So I'm slightly rushing, but I already I already dialed the tone in and then had moved on. So I'm like, I can't recreate the tone. The tone's awesome. So what can I do? So I ended up going with an eighth note uh, tremolo with a pretty hard cut to really help it establish that it's sitting dead on with the drums. Um, so if, if I'm a little ahead of the beat, it's happening where the tremolo is off, so you, you don't hear it anymore. And I did a pretty hard cut on it, and then I just I tweaked it a little bit so it's not too choppy. Um, you know, it, it's slightly gradual, so it does it's not very abrasive. So that was my way of fixing my mistake of slightly rushing and interfering with the vocals on verse 2. The absolution of the gods of the past I found a new messiah dressed in all black And then the second chorus comes in and I approached it uh, exactly the same way I did the first. Um, oh, there is one other thing I should bring up. One of the, the big parts of this song is that snare, you know, going into the chorus that da 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 da. Um, and I didn't want to follow the snare again for both hats. Um, musically, again, it's something I picked up from Jamie in the last video. The idea that you know, when the chorus is coming, typically everyone's gunning for the chorus. So if you drop the low end and then bring the low end on beat one of the chorus, it makes the chorus hit that much harder. So 
from a musical standpoint, that's why I went with that. From a production standpoint, a video producer standpoint, um, I shot Will's video for this first. So I heard his take before I heard anybody else's, and he locked in with that snare, um, and it was really cool. And I'm like, okay, well, in the interest of making the video interesting, let me not do that, um, just because he did it. So that decision worked on twofold, um, again, both musically and from a, a video production standpoint. So anyway, chorus two, uh, second chorus, same as the first. And then going into the outro, uh, again, I kind of channeled my inner Nikki Tedesco with the effects. Uh, but I also kind of wanted to, I guess, to be fair, I could see her doing this too, uh, had she gone this direction. Um, but I kind of wanted to channel a little bit of, of Cliff Burton vibes. So the, the outro is really driving, the guitars get bigger, the drums get bigger. So I'm just hitting, again, just whole notes, just diamonds, just hitting the D and the F and letting the synth do the work for me to where, again, it kind of sounds like that Cliff Burton, you know, that, that big envelope thing. So I think the first two measures, I'm just hitting straight whole notes, nothing fancy. And then as it moves in, I change it up just a little bit to where I'm, I'm doing the octave now. Uh, on the end of two, so there's a little sense of anticipation. Then from there, uh, just towards the the very end of it, I just wanted to do a callback to verse two because I was, I gotta say, I was a little proud of myself on that run. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that back in. So I just did the D minor run uh, from verse two. And then rather than go to the F, I went to the C. And then the C is the only note that's different. The rest of the run is the same. It's still the same D minor, but instead of starting on D, I'm starting on C. Just to harmonize with the F. Um, and then that's, I mean, that's really about it. I think I, I held a, a whole note at the end, uh, again, just to give the synth envelope time to fully open. So by the time it fully opens, the song is done. So over. I can't think of anything else that sticks out that I did interesting. So please enjoy my obviously mimed performance that is worthy of a Super Bowl halftime show. i 
my macabre friends. <laughs> Welcome me back to the base channel. <laughs> so um, I'm back on this series for five bass players, and it is literally my favorite thing that I've taken part in on YouTube on another channel as far as collaborations because it's so exciting to hear what other bass players do, and it's so exciting to be turned on to new music. And this guy, Brian Mikasa, is so good. If you haven't heard of him, check out his other music. He's You can stream him anywhere. You can check out his YouTube channel. He's got so much talent, and he sings like he sings in key so well, unless he's using auto-tune or something on there, because he was just doing this live YouTube thing, and I'm assuming it was like, it looked really live, and it's he sounded so good. His voice. I love his voice. Okay. I'm done fawning over Brian Mikasa, but this song, I got to tell you guys, you know how I'm always saying I'm a songwriter. That is my thing. I like writing bass lines. That is, that is what my, I love to do. Right. And you can check out my music. And also I perform my music. I'm streaming everywhere, but I do live streams every Saturday, 7 PM Pacific standard time. And I have such a cool crew of subscribers. And some of you guys that you, you found me on the bass channel and um, we just have so much fun doing bass stuff on Saturday night. Every Saturday night. Come on down. So much fun. But anyway, back to this song. So the point is, um, I've we've done other songs, and they've been very riff-heavy songs, right? So they're, they're songs that are, like, driven by a riff. And, and you can, you know, you can kind of tell that, like, the riff is really what the song's about. But then when you get to a song like this, you realize that this is a, this is a totally different type of songwriter. This is a songwriter that has written the, the melody, like he's written the song. It is a one unit song. And so in this case, the reason I'm explaining all this is because in this case, you do not need to play a lot of stuff at all. And I mean, I don't know if I told you guys the story before, but um, Kelly Clarkson's bass player told me that the guy, he, he went in and he played like five notes, five notes. And they're like, can you play less? Then he played three notes, played less. He played one note. They're like, perfect. <laughs> so I never forget that when I'm recording for another bass player. And especially when the song is so song oriented. I just, I just think this is like such a perfect example of where you don't need to show off that you're a magnificent bass player. Okay. <laughs> so that's all I'm saying. <laughs> not that I'm not saying anything about any other performance on this. Cause I've seen no other performance. It's just, this one was like, I don't want to play that much. I really don't, uh, especially just on the chorus, on the chorus. I just want to play the note. One freaking note. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about what inspired me to do the sound that I used, and I'll show you guys the sound that I used. So have you guys heard of J the band Japan? There's the bass player Mick Karn, and um, he was so inspirational at that time. He played a fretless bass, and um, rest in peace, Mick Karn. Um, he he did some really wild stuff. Like, where did he come up with? He's like an alien. So alien bass lines, that's what he did. So I was like, I want to do an alien Mick Karn bass line. <laughs> okay, but th at the end of the day, I did not hone Mick Karn at whatsoever. But what he did do was inspired me to use the fretless. Okay, so let's talk about the bass. So so I'm using this fretless. It's a Mitchell bass, and they gifted this to me. They gifted me a couple bases. I did a review on this bass. It's a really affordable, great beginner style bass that's got, you know, it's perfect. It's perfect intonation. It sounds great, all that, right? But because I have so many bases that, that I uh, always play that are like my tone, I'm always talking about my tone, you know, and this wasn't exactly my tone. And I already had a Fender. This really sounds kind of like a Fender. So I already had a Fender. So I was like, I'm going to mess with this bass. So I pulled the frets off. I mean, I didn't do it. I actually started, when I started playing bass, I started on fretless. This is going to be a long interview, y'all. Just get ready. Get your tea. Okay, get your tea. So when I, I started on a fretless um, because I wanted to be Jocko like everybody else. Come on. So I wanted to be Jocko. I pulled off all the, I literally took a wrench or pliers and I pulled off all the frets left them, left the holes in the bass and, um, played it like that for years. <laughs> then I finally got them filled and then I played fretless for many years. And, um, I moved on because I wanted to growl, but that's a whole nother story and watch that video because uh, that's on this channel. It's the, it's the Spectre and Warwick. And we talk a lot about growl and you know, how to get growl. Anyway, fretless don't have growl unless you're, you know, a really amazing player that I just haven't been able to get it. it, it other guys can do it. I mean, other players can do it, but I have never been able to do it. 
I also changed the pickups. So these are um, the EMG Geezer signature pickups. They're GZRs. And um, they sound super cool. That's the tone. Okay, let me show you what I used here. All right, here we go. I'm using Amplitube IK Multimedia. This is a custom um, setting that I've created, but this is how I did it. It's got the SVTX Pro, so it's like the SVT4, basically um, emulation of that amp. And then the stomp boxes I use, these are both built in with the, um, with the application. So you don't have to buy these separate, but there are separate packages that have different elaborations. This is part of the SVX package, which I highly recommend. Okay, so I just used a Pro Drive with a little bit of distortion, not much at all, and then an Octaver. And so that's that. And then the cab, since I've been now asked about cabs, is just it's just your, you know, 810, your regular old refrigerator. I just take the default because it sounds good the way it is. I don't need to mess with it. This is the way it came. This is the way it was born. I love it. We're moving on. <laughs> So the Octaver adds, you know, when I was playing before and I feel like when I was playing before I turned on um, Amplitude, what I felt when I heard that was something's missing. <laughs> I need something more. And so um, that's when I added the distortion. I was like, yeah, but I don't just want distortion. Then I added the Octaver and I was like, that's the something more that I needed. OK, so let's move on. So this, this song is like a macabre kind of goth pop. And the way the genre is explained um, for Brian Mikasa is um, dark pop. That's his genre, dark pop. Uh, that's what he's called on one of the sites that I found him on. And so dark pop, I was like, dark pop, okay. Ministry with Sympathy, their first album. Because, that, I mean, that's like, that's macabre dark pop. <laughs> so I was like, and as soon as I heard this song, all I could hear was this bass line. It's all I could hear, you guys. So so the main verse, I did this one riff, which is a literal ripoff of, of Ministries Every Day is Halloween. And it's from With Sympathy. So check that, check that album out because it's just fun. And I'm sure you've heard some of the songs before. There's, there's a few hits on there. And um, I completely ripped off that bass line because it's perfect for this song and what bass line hasn't been ripped off before. So that's that. So then uh, I did some signature slides. I call them signature slides because I've always done them. Like uh, there's some things like. And it's just like, it sounds like, does it sound like um, the Munsters? <laughs> Is it the song from the Munsters? Okay. Anyway, that's what I did there. And so um, Nothing special so far except the ministry bass line like really brought it to life. And then for the chorus, like I'm saying, this is why I'm saying it's all about the song. It is all about the song. So for the chorus, there's just kill a be killed, right? And then it's just like boom, boom, <laughs> boom, right? So I was like, I'm not doing, I don't need to do nothing there. I don't need to do nothing because his voice is so beautiful. It kind of reminds me of Silver Sun pickups and I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, put you in a box, Brian. Brian, if you're watching this, call me because I want to do bass for you because I love your music. Just call me. Come on. Let's do something together. Let's collab. So this part, the chorus, like it doesn't need anything. It drops the song title. It is the chorus. Like I don't need to mess with it. If I was if any producer would be like, play less, play less. They'd be like, don't play anything but the root note. So I just went with the root note. And then I threw in my little signature slides because I was like, I got to do something. <laughs> this is the bass channel. <laughs> and then so there's this other part where he goes. Ah. So I was like, oh, I got I to I gotta do that because I loved it. So I was like. And then slide down to the next note. So the fretless just adds a little bit of because I knew I, I, I couldn't do a lot on the song. So the fretless just adds a little personality where, you know, I couldn't put personality in note wise, but I could put it in stylistically wise with the fretless, right? Okay. Oh, at the end, there's this little walk that I added because there's like this right, um, monstrous thing.
like that. So I put in a little walk right there, and uh, that's pretty much the whole the whole thing of what I did on the song as far as playing it. So um, the next interview question is, um, what did I use from some of the other videos from bass from a bass playing um, technique perspective? And I did from the other videos. I totally learned stuff. The two cool things that I learned from the other videos, if you haven't seen them, is one thing was. Um, Josh didn't need the five string, but he used it anyway because he wanted that low note. And, and I have used that. I have totally used that. And you guys heard it in the last video. And then um, there's another technique that I haven't used yet, but it's where the bass drops out for like, let's say, um, I think it might be like the second chorus, like the first or two bars of the second chorus maybe is a choice. It's a choice where you choose to do it. The bass will drop out. And then it comes back in. And so that way it's like, oh, you missed the bass now that it's back. <laughs> you're, ha you're more excited because it's there. It's kind of like give, your chances, give yourself a chance to miss the bass for a second. Like listen to the song without the bass and now you know how awesome the bass is. So needed. Um, I haven't used that. But now that I've heard somebody ex tell me that they did it, now I've heard it in so many songs. I've heard it in a lot of old R&B songs, which is I didn't expect that's where I was going to find it. And that's where I found it. So to answer that question, long story short, and I really want to answer this question. I did not use any technique that I learned from any other video. And the reason I'm making this really clear, <laughs> I could just not answer the question, but I'm making this really clear because what I want to say about that is this. It is so awesome to me to hear other bass players the way they write. Like this guy, Jamie, he just, every time he plays, he blows me away. And, and I used to, when I was, when I started out, when I would hear players like that, I would get discouraged because I would think I'm never going to play like that. Like I will never play that good. And, and I could never even think of that baseline. Where did he come up with that? That's Jamie comes up with these riffs. I'm like, I would never think of that. And it's incredible. And it discourages, it used to discourage me until I realized I have my own style and you guys do too. Every bass player has their own style that it's a bass line they would come up with, not somebody else. And that's what you have to contribute to the bass world, to the bass community, is your style. So don't get discouraged by other bass players. If they're not inspiring you, listen to something else and then go back to them later <laughs> and try to play their bass line. You'll probably be able to do it. But my point is, is that I literally on purpose didn't use any other technique that I learned from anyone else, but I did incorporate the technique or the attitude of what I'm going to come up with is uniquely mine, even though I stole it from ministry, <laughs> but you know, it's unique in the way I'm going to play it. I'm going to deliver it. The tone I'm going to use, you know, what, what baseline I chose to steal <laughs> is uniquely my choice. <laughs> And so that's the technique I incorporated was I chose to fo like rely on my ability to come up with something cool, right? And that's what I, I keep telling you guys as bass players, do that. <laughs> rely on your ability to come up with something unique and cool on your own because that's how people write new stuff. That's how new stuff comes out. We don't, we can never be another Jocko because Jocko already lived, you know, we need to be our, our own person. And then that's how we will become the next, I don't want to say Jocko because I feel like that's pretty like, <laughs> but we can become the next like bass player that's like, oh yeah, remember that guy, you know, after we're dead and all, <laughs> Chris, this is getting really morbid. Back to basics. Use your own unique style because that is what's going to set you apart and make you memorable is to use what is uniquely your style. And that's the style I chose. <laughs> anyway, okay. I hope you guys enjoy it. Have a good day. I'll see you all later. Bye. I'll see you on the next video. We're doing my song. Bam, bam, bam. So I can't wait to hear what people did. So y'all have a good day and come see me on my live stream. Bye. Saturdays, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. See y'all later.